Understanding Intermediate Accounting, Part 18, Stock Options Expense. This is Ken Boyd, the owner of St. Louis Test Preparation. Here's our email address and our phone number. And the website from a university accounting course where we took some of the information for this lecture. We started the last video uh, starting the discussion of stop options expensing. And a few points that I wanted to repeat. The first is that there is a fair value option pricing model, which simply means that if we grant stock options to an employee and we think a certain number of those will vest, meaning that the employee will fill the conditions, exercise the options, and buy the stock, there's a fair value to that exercising, and we want to include that fair value in our expense calculation. So there's a method of doing that that's really beyond the scope of this value, but you should know that there is a process for doing that. There's a period of service, some conditions that apply to how long an employee must remain employed at the company to get the options. This is, again, a benefit where the longer the employee stays, the more they profit from getting stock options, holding them, and exercising them. And finally, that there's going to be some changes in our paid-in capital as a result of the stock options expense. Flipping over to Excel here, here's Levi Jean's company trying to figure out the stock options expense. And on 1231.08, they want to reward an employee and encourage that employee to stay long-term by granting stock options. This employee has the right to purchase 100 shares of $1 par common stock at $35. The current market value is 40. The market price of 40 is above the option price of 35. So it is attractive right now to own and have the right to exercise these options. You've got a $5 per share gain there that's unrealized, but it is a gain. But there's conditions attached. The employee must be employed by the company between 1231.08 and 1231.2010. Again, it's an incentive to get the employee to stay. And if they stay that period of time, they can exercise or use the option to buy stock any time between 1231.2010 and 1231-2012, after which the rights expire worthless. We're going to assume our fair, our fair value option pricing model comes up with a value on these options of $1,200. Again, it makes some assumptions about how much of these options will vest <clears throat> and what the mar fair market value will be. On 1231 or wait, we don't make any journal entry. Because although we've granted stock options, nothing has transpired that affects the financials. You see that on 1231.09 and 1231.10, we're going to recognize half of the stock options expense. And the reason for that is, is that as the employee fills those conditions and stays at the company longer, that's the period of time over which we will expense the options. That's why we say here in blue, that's the period of time over which the employee performs the service, specifically the service being staying at the company and working. I'm going to make a correction there. One of two years in 09, two of two years in 2010. So our entry is we're going to recognize an expense called compensation expense. And our credit is going to be paid in capital from stock options. Again, assuming that an employee would exercise the option and by doing that pay money in for the common stock which we would call paid in capital. The six hundred dollars happens to be half of the fair mark of the total fair market value we calculated in our fair option pricing model. So it's six hundred dollars of expense in 09 the first year that they have to stay and six hundred dollars of expense in 2010, the second year they have to stay. So that two-year period of time goes by and the employee decides after 1231-2010 that they'd like to exercise some of the options and buy stock. So let's assume that on March 10th they're going to exercise options and buy 50 shares 
they have options to purchase 100 total. They decide to exercise and purchase 50 shares. So what will the transaction be? Well, it's going to be the employee payment of 50 shares times $35 a share. That was the price at which, that's the price we agreed to that was offered on the option. So that's $1,750 shares times option price. Like we said before, there's going to be paid in capital in the stock options. But it's going to change because we're going to take the paid in capital stock options off the books. That $600 we originally credited. Now we're debiting. So the paid in capital for the options no longer exists because the options don't exist. They've been exercised. So we are taking paid in capital options off of the books. The options don't exist anymore because they were exercised. Instead, we have common stock, $1 par times 50 shares is $50. Shares times par value of $1. And the new paid-in capital is paid-in capital on the common stock that the employee now owns. So we have paid-in capital in excess of par, which we've seen in the equity section of the balance sheet before. And I call this a plug figure to make the entry balance. We've got to have debits equal credits. And since we know these three numbers, cash, paid in capital options, we're taking off the books, and the par value of the common stock, what's ever left, in this case $2,300, that's going to be the credit entry for paid in capital in excess of par. So we went from paid in capital stock options, which we debit to remove from the books. We now have paid in capital in excess of par for the common stock that's a credit. A little hard to understand because they're, both of these accounts are titled paid in capital. One is stock options, they're gone and they're replaced by common stock shares. So you have to be careful labeling your accounts because although they're both say paid in capital they're for different reasons. The final example is he exercised 50 of the options and let's say he chooses on 12-31-2012 the last date he can exercise to let the options expire worthless. Just like we did in the March entry of 2011, we're going to remove the paid in capital stock options from the books by debiting $600. The options no longer exist, in this case they expired. And we're going to credit paid in capital expired options to account for the fact that 50 shares of options were allowed to expire. So to review, we grant the options, we have no journal entry. We expense the options over the period of time that the person performs the service, in this case being employed at the company. End of 2009, compensation expense debit. End of 2010, compensation expense debit. When he exercises the options, cash comes in the door. We remove the paid in capital for the options. We have common stock and paid in capital for the stock, replacing those two debits, replacing the paid in capital stock options. And finally, if they're allowed to expire worthless, we again take the paid in capital stock options off the books. That happens in both entries. And we replace it with paid in capital expired options. So at the end, by 12-31-2012, in order to correctly account for this, we have to remove all the paid in capital for stock options, whether people exercise the options or whether they allow them to expire worthless paid in capital for stock options going to come off the books. That's the end of part 18. Here's our YouTube channel. We do small group live chats monthly that are inexpensive. We also do one-on-one -on -one tutoring using gotomeeting.com. Here's all of our contact information and we'll see you next time.